Thank you and good morning everybody and uh, uh, let's continue with our series of lectures on uh, deep neural networks. What we've seen so far is what a network is and what it means to train the network. We also went through the rather difficult lecture on backdrop. It's one of those uh, terribly easy concepts which is also horrendously difficult to explain in a uh, in an understandable way. So while I tried, I don't know if I've succeeded. But then today, we're, well, in the next couple of lectures, we're going to look at the conditions under which uh, the entire training process does work. So here's a quick recap. The story so far, neural networks are universal approximators. They can model any odd thing if they have the right architecture. They must, but to make them model any particular function, we must train them which means we have to learn their weights and biases. And the way we train them is to minimize a total loss on a training set. We do this through empirical risk minimization and use variants of gradient descent to do so. And the gradient of the, the loss with respect to network parameters is computed using backpropagation. This is what we've seen so far. Here's a quick recap for the gradient descent algorithm. This is how the algorithm works. If we want to find the value x, which minimizes any function f of x, then we begin with an initial guess for the optimal x, and then iteratively adjust it by a step opposite to the direction of the derivative until the function bottoms out. For neural networks, the function we want to minimize is the loss, which is the average divergence between the actual output of the network and the desired output of the network. This of course is a function of the network parameters. And so when we use gradient descent to learn the network, uh, we minimize this loss with respect to these parameters. The way we do it, we initialize all of the parameters of the network, all the weights and biases, and then iteratively update it. And each iterat iteration we first compute the average derivative of the divergence with respect to network parameters across the entire training set, and then subtract a step proportional to it from the current parameter estimate. And we continue this until the loss is converged. You've already seen some of this in your homeworks. Now, to be able to implement gradient descent, we need to be able to compute this uh, derivative term, which is the derivative of the divergence between the actual and desired outputs of the network for individual training instances. And this we compute using backdrop. And so uh, the issue is how, how well uh, the, uh, does this entire process work? Wait, something happened here. What's going on? Someone just drew a mustache on my screen. Can you see it? Odd. So I think this is a Zoom issue. This is, go back to mouse. Okay, all right, so the questions we are left with is, does this procedure actually learn what, what we want it to learn? And whether the network we learn in this parameter will generalize? And so let's begin by answering for the first of these questions. So moving on, the first question we're going to look at is this, does backpropagation always work? And if so, how and when will it converge to the correct answer? What are the restrictions on it? Are, and how can we speed up the algorithm? Are there any alternatives to gradient descent? And we'll also look at uh, some important modifications of the approach, the method of stochastic gradient and other speed up, te speed up techniques. These, uh, even, we will not cover all of these lecture, these topics in today's lecture. We're going to cover half of these. We will continue on this series 
in the next couple of lectures. The first question is this one. Is backpropagation always going to find the correct, correct solution? So say we want the network to learn a classification function. We provide training data, and then we minimize the average divergence between the sigmoid output of the network and the desired output. Backprop, or rather gradient descent, tries to find network parameters that minimize this loss. And let's assume that we actually found the network parameters that actually minimize this loss. We found the global minimum. Does this mean that we have found the correct solution, the one that gives us the minimum classification error on the training data? So anybody recall this uh, uh, question? Do you think, how many of you think that if your network training actually finds the global minimum of the loss function, that's also going to minimize classification error? How many think that's the case? Raise your hand. Quite a few, right? So let me stop here, uh, let me continue here, but recap this, right? Remember what we said about differential activations. When we use threshold activations, uh, when we were trying to compute the, uh, quantify the network's performance, what we were really doing was counting errors. And we saw that this was not differentiable. So if you move the threshold activations threshold left or right, the error would not change. And so you could not say if, the, uh, if you were moving in the right direction. When we used a continuously variable activation, we could compute the distance uh, from the, of the desired output from the current output of the network. And this distance was the divergence. We can now adjust the network parameters to minimize this total distance. But then, as someone pointed out in the last class when we discussed this, this doesn't mean that we are going to have the correct answer always. Why so? Anybody want to guess? Looking at this figure, can you tell me why minimizing this total distance doesn't mean you are going to minimize classification error? Anyone? Anything in the chat? Nothing from chat. So someone take a guess. Someone did answer this last time. I'll wait. Yeah. Apparently not. Someone okay. From the chat, please. Is it is only a sampling? I'm not sure if that's. No, I'm speaking of actually on the samples themselves. Does the right. threshold matter? Does the threshold matter? Uh, it shouldn't. Okay, let me answer this for you. If I begin counting this distance, right? Suppose I have a very large number of samples out here, all of which have very minuscule distance individually, but I have a trillion of them. What will happen to this curve? Anyone? Or say, yeah. It will shift left to minimize the distance of the trillion points. Exactly. It's going to ignore what's happening at the boundary because it's going to try to focus on the mass because we are beginning to count the distance, right? Whereas when you're worried about the classification error, you're really interested in what's happening near the boundary. And so this means that in this particular case, minimizing the total distance over here doesn't necessarily minimize the classification error. Did that make, make sense to everybody? Anyone who didn't get it, raise your hand. So there's a very nice paper on this by these guys, by, by uh, Brady, Sloney, but we'll get it in a second. But in classification problems, the classification error is a non-differentiable function of the weights, the differentiable, the divergence is only a proxy for the classification classification error. And minimizing the divergence may not minimize classification error. So let's take a look at this. This is Brady, Raghavan, and Swani, 89. So let's say I have all of these training points. This, this is a beautiful paper which says, 
backprop fails to separate where perceptron succeeds. So these classes are linearly separable. If I used the perceptron learning rule, would I find a uh, classifier which correctly classifies all of these? Anyone? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. So now, what about if I used a logistic output and I used, let's say, the L2 divergence and I minimized it? Would this perceptron used with the logistic output find the correct decision boundary? Anyone? Anything no. in the chat? No one yes on the chat. So somebody said yes. It should, right? Why should it not? These things are nicely separated far away, right? Uh, but then, if I add this one spoiler, I've got a thousand of these, a thousand of these, and a thousand of these, and then I just add this one spoiler. What would happen with the perceptron? Perceptron rule, would it find the boundary? Anyone? Yeah. Because it's guaranteed to, right? It's actually gonna find it in a finite amount of time. What would happen for the divergence-based backprop? It would focus on separating uh, the clusters of points. Exactly, because these things are going to be so, so many more than this one little guy out here. Their contribution to the uh, loss is going to grossly outweigh the contribution of this one guy. So this will drag the decision boundary a little bit, but unless you let the weights blow up, that boundary is going to shift just a little. It's not going to actually learn to separate this guy. Now, suppose I had another spoiler out here. Once again, the perceptron would capture it. The uh, divergence-based backdrop is only going to shift the boundary just a little. And so every time I shift the, per the spoiler, the boundary found by the perceptron classification rule is going to swing around and it's going to classify it just right. Because in every case that we just saw, the two classes are linearly separable, but the, uh, back, but the solution found by backdrop isn't necessarily going to pick up that outlier. So is this good behavior or is this bad behavior in your opinion? I think it depends on the situation. Sometimes it can be good to be robust to these outliers, and sometimes we want it to conform to that uh, spoiler. So in general, it's actually a good thing. Why so? The perceptron can change greatly on adding just a single training instance. It's going to fit your training, training data really well, which means it has low bias. It's always going to find the right answer but it has high variance. Just changing one single training point can change your solution completely. Whereas what you get with backprop, backprop prefers consistency over perfection. So it has low variance. It's not going to swing around just because you moved one point. On the other hand, this comes at the cost of errors. It has a potential cost of bias. And so uh, in the general case, we prefer low variance estimators at the cost of bias. So in most settings, this is actually a good thing. Make sense to everybody? Questions? We had an opinion which said like, isn't it bad because this will make the perceptron more vulnerable to outliers, which you want. The perceptron rule, yes, but not backdrop. That's the point, right? So we are saying that uh, the, uh, the uh, low variance behavior of the perceptron actually makes it a bad thing in many situations. It's very uh, vulnerable to outliers, whereas backprop is gonna give you the, it's not gonna swing around, it's going to give you mostly the right solution. And it's not just for linearly separable classes. Suppose you have classes of this kind. Now these are the boundary, ideal boundaries curved. So you train a network, it's going to learn this boundary. And then now I add one little outlier over here, this guy is not going to go off and change wildly and change the boundary to this one. It's going to maybe move a little bit. So even the more complicated networks, which are trained using backdrop, 
tend to have a more robust behavior and uh, have low variance. So backprop, the divergence minimization based backprop in general tends to be a, uh, a better choice of learning mechanism than something that just blindly corrects classification errors. So, yeah. Here's a poll. For those of you who cannot see the poll, let me, that's the poll. So this has a lot to do with the divergence function, correct? It has, but that's a very good question. If I, uh, I used L2 as my example in this particular case, what would happen if I use the KL divergence? So you can end the polling here. What would happen, do you think? It would be less sensitive or more sensitive to, mm, less sensitive to the outliers? It's actually going to be more sensitive, more. right? So, but then, uh, but there, but there is a uh, flip side to this. So, uh, KL, when you use KL divergence, you're going to get, in in this case, you're going to get the lowest. Uh, here's something very interesting. If I use the Kullback Leibler divergence, right? Uh, what is the, or even the L2 divergence? You'll know that I said something very careful over here for bounded doubly. Why is that so? So suppose I gave you a network, even for this problem, where I, I have these classes which are perfectly separable and my network is capable of finding the boundary. What is the weight going to be for the final classification for the output layer, what are the weights going to be? If I found a global minimum. Anyone? What would it be? Somebody want to take a guess? So let me explain. It's going to be unbounded. Here is why. So if I've got, if the classes are, if the classes are separable, they're like so, right? Then if I'm count, if I'm actually looking at the distance to these guys, when is the distance smallest? Total distance smallest. What should the sigmoid look like? Anybody? Diksha, can you repeat the entire question again? We have someone on the chat asking for it. Okay, so going back to this question, suppose I have these separable classes and I have a network that can actually capture this boundary, then what is the, what are the weights going to be like for the uh, final output neuron at the minimum, when, when the loss is minimum? So to answer that question, here is my plot, right? So these are my training points. This is the sigmoid. When will the total distance be minimum? What should happen to the sigmoid? It will turn to threshold. It will turn to a threshold, correct? When it turns to a threshold, what is the weight? Infinity. Infinity, exactly, right? As the weights increase, the sigmoid is gonna get steeper. For a situation like this, the, uh, the uh, minimum loss solution is unbounded. There are so it's an unstable problem. That's why I kept saying everywhere uh, the uh, weights are bounded. Because even if I bound my weights, I'm here. It's possible for, to find a boundary which perfectly separates. And a perceptron algorithm would. But in the case of the MLP, it's going to try to become a threshold and the weights are going to be unbounded. And this will be a problem, which is why you end up using things like regularizers. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? No questions. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still confused why I'd go to infinity. I... Okay, so here, again, go back to this one, right? Yeah. So, so uh, look at this. These are my points. 
Yeah. These are, these are my positives and these are my negatives, okay? Mm -hmm. now, now, if I'm using a sigmoid, then my sigmoid is going to look like so, right? Yeah. And I'm trying to minimize the total length of these distances. Okay. When will that total length be zero, at least? It's when my sigmoid morphs into this function. Yeah, and then the equation for like the threshold would be... So, so, there, uh, so no, but it's a sigmoid. Remember, it's one over one plus e raised to minus z, z times okay. w, right? This is going to become in. This means this is infinitely steep. That happens when if z, z is even just a little bit off from zero, off or from the threshold, in this particular whatever, right? Then the thing should immediately fall to zero, and if it's in, it's if it's a little bit to the right of it, it should immediately go to one. Okay. That only happens if W is infinity. Oh, okay. Make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. So that's why it's unbounded. That's why you need the other, uh, you know. And unbounded stuff is not good. It's never good. Okay. Um, Bhikshu, we had a question about backprop, and it says, uh, would backprop be better for probabilistic data, uh, and perceptron be better for deterministic data? So this, this, uh, as far as your training data are concerned, they are deterministic, right? right. So uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's no distinction between the two. But if your classes are inseparable, then the perceptron rule is never going to find it. In any case, if you have a multi-layer perceptron, you're not going to be using the perceptron rule because it's too complex. The whole point of this is that backprop is not necessarily going to find you the minimum error solution. Number one and number two, that's not a bad thing. Okay, now let's go back and let's look at this business of the uh, loss surface itself. Now we have assumed so far that when we spoke of gradient descent, that finding the parameters where the gradient descent converges is sufficient to find a good estimate for the network parameters. Now, is this correct? Gradient descent will stop making updates if the gradient goes to zero. So it also, it, it will stop making updates at the minimum. It's definitely going to stop making updates when the gradient goes to zero. And the loss is a function of network parameters. These would be your network parameters. This is going to be the loss surface. So you can think of it as a surface on the space of network parameters. And in fact, the surface can be undulating with very many points where the gradient can actually become zero and which are not the minima. For example, these two, these locations two have zero gradient but the actual minimum is out here. And depending on where you begin, gradient descent can end up in one of these locations. And uh, so this is not a good thing. You really want to be finding the minimum loss solution. At least that's what we like to believe. So what kind of situations exist where you can have gradients at the wrong locations where the algorithms can get stuck? Now, there are very many hypotheses. To, about what the loss surface actually looks like. One popular hypothesis is that in large networks, the majority of points where the gradient goes to zero are saddle points. They basically literally look like saddles, where if you, there are some directions where the function goes back up, but in other directions, if you continued in the same direction, the function is going to go down. So uh, they, uh, if you think of it in terms of Hessians, the Hessian is going to be negative in some direction, the negative in some directions, and positive in other directions. So uh, we don't actually have the luxury of computing the Hessians, but if you look at the gradients, just because you got a zero gradient doesn't really mean you're at a minimum. And the hypothesis says that saddle points are extremely frequent in large networks, and their frequency of occurrence is exponential in network size. The other type of situation where you can ha have zero gradient is at spurious minima, that are spurious, spurious locations that are local minima, like these little bowls here, uh, which are not the actual minima. The real minimum lies somewhere else. And another hypothesis about local minima is that these local minima are all equivalent and that the loss value at the bottom of all of these local minima are going to be very similar. And they're actually, and the hypothesis says it doesn't matter which local minimum you find, that the value of the loss at the local minimum is going to be very close to the uh, loss at the global minimum. So getting stuck at a local minimum is not a bad thing. Now, these are all the various hypotheses uh, that people have come up with. Uh, 
through mathematical analyses of losses. They apply only to large networks, but uh, uh, the uh, reality is when we begin dealing with these networks, we have we cannot actually uh, depend on these results because the specifics of our problem could be very different. Now, uh, so here are all the various kinds of papers that people have had in trying to understand the loss surface. Uh, Baldi and Hornick state that an MLP with a single hidden layer only has saddle points and lo no local minima. Uh, Dauphin et al. claim large networks can have an exponential number of saddle points. These guys, Chamuranska et al., think that for large networks, most local minima lie in a small band in the parameter space, and they're all equivalent. Uh, sure, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, Schwartz. Schwartz et al. claim that in networks of finite size, trained on finite data, you can have terrible local minima. So if you, do, if you just look at all of these results, they are kind of jumbled. They all refer to different uh, situations and we keep getting newer and newer results, but there's no single conclusion that we can actually come to that we can latch on to for uh, when we actually set out to train our network. Um, so, Richard, yeah. So we have one. How large are these networks approximately that we are talking about here? So we are speaking of, when we speak of large, you're speaking of millions of parameters. In fact, uh, the largest networks we see today can have tens or even hundreds of billions of parameters. Now, uh, when you're looking at small tasks, the smaller the network, you know, if you're in the hundreds of thousands or the tens of thousands of parameters, the more, the more ugly the loss function tends to be. At least that is one of the uh, results we've seen. Um, the other question is actually based on the papers that you have shown. So is there a particular reason why there was a huge time difference between the selection of papers? <laughs> because there was a huge time difference between when neural networks first came out and when people really began taking them up. So neural networks were uh, sort of popular in the early, early 90s and the late 80s. And then around the year 2000, if your paper had the title neural network, then the odds were it would get bounced from MIPS. Well, it was not 2010 before they actually became popular again. So they had, it was actually this gap, this dead, dead gap where they weren't very popular and we didn't have very many results. So I just chose one of the older results and a bunch of the more recent ones. Um, and also one more follow-up question is, how does the network size increase the number of saddle points? I wish I could give you that answer easily. I mean, uh, I've read these papers and I can't even tell you that. I can't, I, I can't say I even fully understood the math. And whatever it is, I'm not going to be able to explain it here at this time. But it's a good question. We should take it offline and uh, we're kind of hoping we can give a, put out a little uh, uh, tutorial on some of these results later in the course. Yeah, no more questions. Sorry. Okay, so now another issue is that of convergence. In the discussion so far, we've assumed that the training arrives at a local minimum. Does it always do so? And if it does so, how long does it take? Now, this is very hard to analyze for multi-layer perceptrons. So we're going to look at it from the lens of a simpler problem that we do understand. It's what I call, what is popularly known as the street light effect. You're all familiar with this story someone loses his keys in the bar and then comes and searches for it under the street light because he's more likely to be able to find it here because it's too dark in the bar. You know, we can't really analyze convex function, uh, neural networks, but we can analy analyze convex functions. So that's what we'll do. We're going to uh, use the street light effect. We'll look at things from, from the perspective of convex loss functions and we'll try to transfer the intuitions we develop to to the actual problems that we solve. So what do we mean by convex? Now a surface is convex if it's continuously curving upwards. Uh, so these are all, a surface of this kind would be convex. The surface of this kind would also be convex. It has a very specific property. If I take any two points on the surface and connect them with a line, that line will always be above the surface. That is the nature of a convex function. So over here, these curves are convex 
these curves are not convex. There are many mathematical definitions for convexity, but they're all basically equivalent to this concept. Similarly, you can define convex set. A convex set is a set where I can pick any two points in the set. If I draw a line between these two points, every point in the line will also be in the set. So these two are convex sets. This set is not convex because if I draw a line between X and Y, it goes outside the set for a little bit of the time. So uh, we will sort of look at things from the perspective of convex surfaces because they are bowl shaped. And in bowl shaped surfaces, gr gradient descent, if properly done, will always arrive at this minimum. Now, so what do we mean by convergence of gradient descent? Gradient, gradient descent is an iterative algorithm. It tries to find the minimum of a function and it's going to take several steps to get there. Now, if the steps sort of sequentially lead to the solution that you want to get, this is said to converge. On the other hand, you can have situations where, depending on how you set it up, where instead of sort of eventually arriving at the solution, it comes close to, close to the solution and begins bouncing around. It could actually just jitter around instead of actually finding the solution, or it could even just blow up and diverge. So what are the different conditions for this, for, for these uh, different behaviors? Uh, let's take a look. Now, before we go there, we, let's see, uh, I'll just briefly introduce the notion of quantifying convergence. We can quantify the convergence behavior of an algorithm through something called a convergence rate, which tells you how quickly the iterations approach the solution. Now, so for example, uh, if I had some function and let's say this is the actual global minimum, so those are my, uh, my level sets and this is my global minimum. And let's say I have my first iteration over here, the next iteration has gone here, the third iteration has gone here. So this guy is at this distance from the global minimum. This guy is at this distance from the global minimum. So D2, D1, and this is D2. So D2 over D1 is the amount by which the, the fraction by which the distance to the global minimum has reduced. And the large, and the uh, larger this is, I mean, the smaller this is, the uh, faster the algorithm is converging. So convergence, one way of quantifying convergence rate is the ratio of the distances from the current estimate to the optimum between consecutive iterations. Now, if this is constant, or say it's upper bounded by a constant, that means each iteration, let's say this, this value R is 0.5, then it means that at each iteration, you have the gap to the minimum. So, uh, which means you're basically really arriving exponentially fast. In 10 steps, you're going to be 1,000th of the distance that you were in the beginning. But still, we sort of like to call this linear convergence because if you take the logs, uh, then, wait a minute. Uh, the uh, if you want to if you say uh, if if you want to ask a question of how many iterations is it going to take for me to get to within epsilon of the uh, of the uh, global optimum, then you're going to say r raised to k is epsilon, or taking logs, k log r equals so k is the number of steps, right? equals log epsilon. So to get to within log epsilon of the solution, the number of steps is k. And so because this is a linear function of the number of steps, we call it linear convergence. But again, linear convergence really means you're getting to the solution exponentially fast. And it turns out for, uh, and that's the kind of behavior we really like. Now, let's start off by considering the, a really nice kind of convex surface. Of all the various types of convex surfaces you can have, quadratic surfaces, which have basically this quadratic equation form, half a w squared plus bw plus c, these are the nicest. Now, 
if I give you a function of this kind, just by looking at this function, and I, if I plot it against W, can you tell me if this is a bowl going up or if it's a bowl going down? Anyone? How would you actually look at this function and tell me if it's a bowl of this kind or a bowl of this kind? With the sign of A? The sign of A. If A is, what would A have to be for, for it to be going up? Positive. It has to be positive, right? Because that's a Hessian, the second derivative. And now uh, you can, of course, solve for uh, the uh, minimum of this function directly. But let's say you're doing it with gradient descent instead. So you initialize your estimate for the location of the minimum and then iteratively update your estimate using this gradient descent rule over here. Now, if you do so, then uh, this is, uh, uh, you will eventually sort of arrive at the optimum. Now, but how quickly, what must the step size be for you to arrive at the optimum really quickly? To answer this, I'm going to use a Taylor series of expansion. How many of you are familiar with Taylor series of expansions? Anyone? Uh, I remember hearing about them, but it's been a while. All right, okay. So here's what Taylor series expansions do. Suppose I have a function of some kind then if the function is continuous, continuous and, and has all, de all derivatives, it turns out that if I just know the value of the function and every single derivative at any particular point, that is sufficient for me to completely construct, construct the entire function. So let's say I know, I know f of x zero, which is the value of the function here. I, I know the first derivative, I know the second derivative and so on, all infinite derivatives. Then I can just say f of x equals f of x zero plus x minus x zero, f prime of x zero plus x minus x zero squared over two, f double prime of x zero, this is the second derivative, plus x minus x zero cubed, over three factorial f triple prime of x zero and so on. It's going to be x minus x zero raised to n over n factorial times the nth derivative of x zero. So you'd, you'd sum this to, through all the derivatives. Now this expansion has a very nice property. You can immediately see how this, what it's doing. Let's say I'm exactly at x zero. Then all of these x minus x zero terms are going to become zero. So you get the correct answer for the only term that remains is f of x zero, which gives me the correct value for the function here. Now, uh, if I look at the first derivative, the first derivative, of course, this doesn't have the first derivative, so this goes away. When I do, when I differentiate it once x minus x zero will go away, so I'll be left with f prime of x zero. And all of the other guys will be left with the x minus x zero terms. And so they're gonna become zero. So the second derivative of this expansion to the right, let me write it more cleanly, that's going to be f of x zero plus x minus x zero, f prime of x zero plus f double prime of x, sorry. I'm going slower than I should. I'll speed up at some point. So x minus x zero squared over two f double prime of x zero. Let me stop at the third. X minus x zero cubed over six f triple prime of x zero. So if I take the first derivative of the term to the right, this guy is going to go away because it doesn't have any x term. Over here, the x minus x zero will go away, so this remains. 
this is going to become two times x minus x zero over two. So the x minus x zero term is going to remain. This is going to become three times x minus x zero squared over six. Again, x minus x zero is going to remain. So now if I compute the second, the, the first derivative of the series at x zero, this is the only term that remains. So the series also captures the first derivative over here. In fact, it will turn out that the series captures every single derivative of the function out here. And you can show that it's going to model the function from minus infinity to plus infinity, if all the derivatives exist. So if I'm going to use, let's say I've, I've come up with an initial estimate, WK, and I take a Taylor series expansion of this guy. So now because this is a quadratic, it has only two derivatives. It doesn't have the third derivatives onwards as zero. So I can restrict my Taylor series expansion to three terms. The first term is going to be just the value of the function itself at WK. The second derivative is going to be the derivative of the function at WK times W minus WK. The third derivative is going to be half of W minus WK squared times the second derivative. This is just the Taylor series ex expansion. And here is the guarantee that regardless of what WK is, this is actually the bowl. This is a guarantee. So now I have a quadratic function, right? These two functions are going to be the same, but let's look at this guy. I like this guy because it's in terms of WK. So can I solve this guy and find out where it's a minimum? How would I do it? Anyone? This is a derivative. This is a quadratic. How do I find out where it's a minimum? Take a derivative. I can take a derivative and solve for it, right? So if I do that, then I'm going to get uh, the de so this is I'm going to be solving for w. This is not a function of w. This is going to go away. I will be left with this guy. This is going to be e prime wk. Then the second term is going to be e prime double prime wk times w minus wk. And this is this is zero. If I solve, if I and I'm trying to solve for the w, right? So this is going to give me w equals uh, wk. I can move this to the right minus e prime wk over e double prime wk. So you see where this equation works out, how the solution came about. This is guaranteed to give me the minimum, right? Now, question anyone? Nothing on chart. Okay, so this is my solution. The location of the minimum is the current estimate minus the inverse of the second derivative times the derivative. Now compare this update to the gradient descent update rule, right? If you compare it, it's telling me something about the optimal step size. There is a step size over here, which if I used, I would get to the solution in one step. What is that step size? Compare inverse these two guys. The second gradient. The inverse of the second derivative, right? Because if eta is exactly equal to this guy, then, then in one step, you're going to get to the minimum, right? So you can see that you arrive at the optimum in a single step using an optimal step size. Now, what happens if I, so going back here, if anybody didn't get that, now's your time to, to let me know, right? Because I'm going to build on this really quickly. I have a quadratic, oh my God, my quadratic is horrible. Uh, this is my minimum, this is my W star. If I'm starting off from here, if I use, what was, and I'm going to say W uh, is updated as W minus eta times, E prime of W, right? E was my function. That's that's what I had. So what was the optimal eta again? Anyone? 
what was the optimal data? Inverse of the second derivative. So this is E double prime W inverse, right? So that is going to get here in one step. What if I use a step size that's less than this guy? What would happen? We need more steps. You're going to take. You're going to take more steps, but eventually you're going to get there. What if I have a step size that's greater than the eta? I mean the optimal step size. You're going to overshoot. And then what happens next? I keep using the same step. Pardon me. We're jumping around at the local minimum. So it's going. It's going to convert, but it's going to do so like so. Right, because if you hate keeps going down, right? Is there a value of eta where things will go bad? If eta is very large, then it will. Save. How large? Infinity. No, there's actually a much better answer than that. If eta is. Second order derivative. Pardon me? Two times of second. Exactly. If it's two times, it's going to go here and it's going to keep bouncing around, right? If it's more than two times, it's going to go up. Make sense to everybody? So here's what will be here happen. If the step size is less than the optimum, that's going to converge sequentially over here. If it's greater than the optimum, but not greater than twice the optimum, it's going to go out and then bounce back in. If it's greater than twice the optimum, it's actually going to diverge. So this is for a quadratic function. Now, if I have a generic function that is convex, but it's not quadratic, then I can always write the generic function as a Taylor series expansion. I can terminate it after just the second term. So it's going to give me a quadratic approximation to this function. And then as before, I can get to the optimum in a single step if I use this inverse of the second derivative of the, uh, of, of the function at this point. And if it's more than twice this guy, it's going to begin diverging. And if I'm using exactly the inverse of the second derivative, the update rule you would get is what is called Newton's method. It's explained on the slides. Please take a look. But did this make sense? I'm assuming so, okay? So, but that was for only a scalar input. Your typical functions are multivariate. So you're going to have, when you have multivariate, it's not like you're, you just have one variable, your weights, you have a collection of weights, you have a weights vector. So the quadratic is going to have this form, half of W transpose AW plus W transpose D plus C. So if, this is a generic quadratic. I'm going to look at a very specific instance where A is diagonal. So if A is, a is diagonal, then uh, basically uh, what I will have is something of this kind. Let me see. Yeah. Shall we have a follow-up question here? Wouldn't yeah. that be the optimum for a quadratic approximation and not the actual function? So, this is going to be optimal for the quadratic approximation, but you can expect that your best guess based on the quadratic approximation. Remember, remember quadratics are the nicest of the convex functions. So if it's going to behave badly for a quadratic, it's probably going to behave badly for whatever function you've got. And so if it's worse than this, you can kind of imagine that things are going to go bad. Right, now, Suppose I have, I have a quadratic function. So then I would have W1, W2. And if my weights vector, you know, if my A matrix is diagonal, then this is simply going to be, become A1, A1, one squared, W1 squared, plus A2, two squared, W2 squared. This straight up linear algebra. If A is not diagonal, you're going to have more terms but that's just a rotation of the space. So we'll just look at this business where the, this multivariate quadratic function is the sum of many quadratic functions. So when you do, in that case, 
Uh, if I were to plot the level set contours, the level set contours are going to look like this. You're going to have many ellipses which are uh, uh, aligned to the axes. And if I'm assuming that it's, I'm looking at this from a top view, the axes are the two coordinates and you're looking at the function from the top, deeper is lower. So the minimum is in the innermost ellipse. Now, because this guy, because I can write the quadratic itself, multivariate quadratic like so, uh, I could, my multivariate quadratic is going to look like A11 squared W1 squared plus B1 W1 plus A22 squared W2 squared plus B2 W2, W2 plus a constant. Now, if I keep changing W2, or in this case, if I keep changing W1, right? If I keep changing W1, for different values of W1, this is going to take different values. So, so I can have I can have F1 of W1, you know, say W1A, W1, right? Or for a different value of W, it's going to be F of W12. In every case, this portion of the function remains the same. Different values of W1 are going to give me the same quadratic with respect to W2, but with a different additive constant, which depends on W1. So if I slice this function at different locations of W1, the shape of the slice is going to be exactly the same. It's going to have the same curvature, which only depends on A22. And the location of the minimum is also going to be the same in every case. It's just that these different curves are going to be at different heights. Similarly, if I sliced it in the horizontal direction, the function at each of these slices is going to have exactly the same shape. Only the heights will be different. The location of the minimum is going to be the same. And the curvature of all of these slices is also going to be the same. And so, this clear to everyone? We have a question. Why is A11 and A22 being squared here? Where am I squaring A22? You, you squared it during like scribbling it on one node. I did? Okay, I might have made a mistake. Uh, I was not squaring it. This, this, this was supposed to be, uh, oh, I did. I make mistakes, sorry. <laughs> that was a mistake. That shouldn't be squared. Thanks for pointing that out, right? So now, suppose I uh, uh, use perform gradient descent. Then at each time from the current estimate, remember what gradient descent does? It takes a step against the current gradient. The gradient is a vector of partial derivatives, which means for every single component of Wi, I'm taking a step against the derivative of the function E with respect to that Wi, this should have been I'm not even sure what this is, this, this should be fixed. And for every wi, the step size is always the same because we're using a common step size uh, the, the, because gradient descent just has a single eta, right? And herein lies the problem. Now, every different direction, if, if I go back and look at my, my uh, uh, quadratic, my quadratic, overall quadratic, is a sum of many independent quadratics. So if I consider the quadratic with respect to W1 over here, what is the optimal step size? Forget the square. What is the optimal step size with respect for this quadratic, if I'm trying to minimize it? Anyone? A11. A11. Inverse, right? Let's see two. Yeah. And for this guy, the optimal step size is going to be A22 inverse. There's a constant missing, but anyway, I, I missed, forgot the half. So if I had the half here, these would be. Then for this second quadratic, this is going to be the optimal step size. For this first quadratic, this is going to be the optimal step size. And let's see what happens. If you look at the, but gradient descent itself uses the same step size for every direction, every component, and this is a problem, right? So let's say this is my loss function and I take some step size. So 
in this func loss function, the bowl is shallow in this direction and steep in this direction. So which of these two is going to have the smaller optimal step size? Anyone? Do you want the same step size for shallow bowls as for steep bowls? No. no. Right, so which of these will require the, uh, the smaller step size? Shallow. Or... Yeah. It's going to be, so here's here, again, it's inverse to the, it's the inverse of the quadratic term, right? And the larger A is, the steeper it is. So in any case, this means, let's say for this guy, the, uh, this, is good. this can tolerate larger steps. And so let's say the optimal step size for this one is one. The optimal step size for this one is 0.33 because the A term is say three. Now, if I took a step size of some value, which is two of say 0.66, right? If I took a step size of 0.66 in this direction, it is less than the optimal step size. So in this direction, it's going to sort of converge slowly to the solution. But in the horizontal direction, it's, it's greater than twice the optimal step size. It's going to diverge. Now, if I had a step size, which is exactly 0.66, that is still less than the optimal step size for the vertical direction. So it's going to sort of step here cleanly, but in the horizontal direction, it's going to bounce around. If the step size were say 0.445, then it's less than uh, twice the optimal step size for the horizontal direction. It's even smaller for the vertical direction. So it's going to converge sequentially in this direction. And in the horizontal direction, it's going to bounce around and slowly converge. And if it's less than say, if it's exactly equal to the optimal step size, if it's the, the, the step size is exactly 0.33, then in the vertical direction, it's much less than one. So it's going to take many steps to get to the solution, but in the horizontal direction, it's going to get there in one step. And if it's less than even 0.33, then it's going to convert slowly in both directions. Did this make sense to everybody? Questions? Yeah. Uh, and it says, if we use a step size that is proportional to the derivative in the dimension, that is what we learned in the previous classes, uh, it will ensure that we need, don't need to maintain separate steps per dimension, right? So the gradient descent itself uses this common rule, which is basically the fact that you have a common step size for everyone. So you're getting to the crux of the problem. Vanilla gradient descent is going to have this problem. You have the same step size for every direction. And this means that uh, the convergence behavior is going to become unpredictable as the dimensions increase because for fastest convergence, ideally the learning rate must be close to the optimal step size for every dimension and it cannot be so, right? So the learning rate must be close to both the largest optimal step size and the smallest optimal step size. And if it's close to the smallest optimal step size, it's going to be too small for this guy. If it's close to this guy, it's probably going to cause divergence for this guy. And so the convergence rate is going to depend on the ratio of the largest and the smallest quadratic coefficients. If the condition number, and if this number is uh, small, if you want this number to be one, right? If this number is large, uh, then it means that the ratio is so large that what is optimal for one is too bad for the other. It'll either cause divergence or it will never converge. Make sense? Questions? Can you do the optimal step for each weight? What would be the problem with that? I'm not sure. So the problem really is again assuming that you're taking you uh, you're, you're going to keep you're going to be keeping track of second derivatives for every single component. Computing second derivatives is immensely com uh, immensely expensive. Number one, and number two, that if you're uh, it turns out that 
the optimal step size for the individual components may not quite combine to what you want it to be when the function is more complex than just a simple quadratic. I see. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, much of the analysis we saw was based on trying to ensure the step size was not so large as to cause divergence within a convex region. Is this even a problem? Let's first ask this our question. Is this a problem, right? Say you have a loss function of this kind. You're out here. If you try to keep to the optimal step size, you're going to slowly descend out here, right? This is not where you want to be. This is where you want to be, or maybe here. So having a large step size actually allows you to escape from local optima. But then if you always have a large step size, you're going to keep bouncing around all the time. So what would be the best thing to do? Scheduler. Scheduler, you can actually start with a large learning rate, greater than two, and slowly reduce it with iterations. So initially it will keep bouncing out, and then eventually it end up, it'll end up in a large shallow bowl, and typically your global minima are going to be large shallow bowls. And then as you keep shrinking it, you'll arrive in a big bowl, which is probably deep, and you'll sort of wander where. Uh, one day away to the bottom. And this minimum is going to be better than this guy. So you always want to have a decaying learning rate and you have, we've seen different kinds of learning rates. You have linear decay, uh, which is uh, uh, where for the, in the kth time step, the decay rate is, uh, you start and have an initial uh, uh, learning rate theta zero, and then it just goes down. Uh, harmonically with the step sizes. You can have quadratic decay where it decays with k squared, k plus one squared, or even exponential decay, or what we do for neural networks. You start with a large learning rate, keep the loss constant till the performance stagnates, then reduce the learning rate and keep doing that. But all of these are basically built on this simple principle over here, that if you start off with a low learning rate, you're likely to get stuck in local minima, but if you keep your learning rate large, you're never going to converge to anything meaningful. Make sense to everybody? Questions? Okay, so gradient descent can miss obvious answers and this may be a good thing. Uh, convergence issues abound. The loss surface has many saddle points and uh, uh, vanilla gradient descent may not converge or converge too slowly. If we are, uh, if, if we just implement it naively. Now, so I'll skip the second order methods. We have a lot of slides on second order methods. Please take a look, they will arrive in the quiz. There's a poll. Let me pull up the poll. This is the poll for those on watching the video. We have a question, why, what is always a bad thing? Could you expand upon that answer? So meaning, is it always bad for the step sizes to be greater than twice the inverse of the second derivative? And the answer, of course, is no, we just saw that, right? Uh, because in this situation over here, this allows us to escape from the from local minima in the beginning. Now, so divergence causing learning rates may not be a bad thing for ugly loss functions. Decaying learning rates provides a good, good compromise between escaping poor local minima and convergence. And as many of you have already pointed out, Many of the convergence issues arise because we force the same sum, same learning rate on all parameters. Now, the question is, why do we do that? Why can't we have separate learning rates for uh, different uh, uh, for the different components? Now, the steps are tied to the gradient, but the optimal learning rate depends on the second derivative. And the second derivative, when you've got a million parameter network, the second derivative is 
devilishly hard to estimate. So we need to have some way of figuring out what the optimal step size is independently for every single component. That is the, uh, and that's not immediately obvious. And so there have been very many solutions, solutions that sort of come up with techniques to give you the optimal step size without actually taking the trouble of computing the second derivative. That, does that answer the various questions that came up? So the back propagation to compute the second derivative is going to be, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to take a quadratic number of operations if backprop vanilla backprop takes a linear number of operations so that's going to be too large if you have a million parameter network you're looking at you know a million square operations to compute the second derivative you don't want to be doing that so how do we actually maintain separate step sizes for the different guys various solutions we're going to take a look at two hard prop also called the resilient propagation algorithm which is a simple algorithm that is to be followed independently for each component. So uh, I'll explain this using figures, right? Imagine, skip the text. Now, what, here's what we know. Uh, say you're at some point. So the thing about R prop is that R prop is independently performed on every single parameter. So you're trying to keep track of a step size and you're trying to keep track of steps and you're going to to deal with each parameter, ignoring every other parameter. And uh, now you have to sort of figure out whether you're doing the right thing or not. Now, what is the, uh, what is the definition of a second derivative? The second derivative says, how much will the loss change if my derivative changes, correct? So can you give me some, some suggestions of how I could take a guess to the second derivative without actually computing it. Anyone? The, the coefficient of, the, of the, the, the biggest within the function you have. Yeah, but again, for that you need a quadratic approximation, right? And that's going to be expensive. So here is what it is. What is the method of, what does the derivative really mean? It means if I change this by a little bit, how much does the loss change? So the second derivative means if I change the derivative by a little bit, how much does the loss change? And so you can do this using methods of differences. You can look at the derivative at the current iteration. You can look at the derivative at the previous iteration. The difference between these two guys is going to give you the difference in derivatives. The difference in the losses at those two steps is going to give you the difference in the loss. And so you can use this to approximate the second derivative. So uh, basically, let's say I have some function here. I, I over here at w0, I computed the derivative. Then over here, I took a step as part of the iteration. Then over here, I ended up at w1, I computed a derivative right? Because that's what I'm doing for gradient descent. But now guess what? I have these two guys. So I can look at W1 minus W0 divided by dou E by dou W1 minus dou E by dou W0. And this begins giving me some idea of the second derivative, does it not? Anyone? Um, um, I have a question on this. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if we like start uh, taking the difference of the derivatives, like we would start with one step size, right? Initially, yes. So that that is very dependent on the, the step size that we start. These derivatives would also be dependent on that. Yes, they would, right. And you're absolutely correct because if it's very large, you're gonna get some wrong answers. So this is why, you know, coming up with this good solutions is a, uh, has been, uh, bit of a challenge, right? So let's take a look at R prop. I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at two, three solutions in the next 10 minutes if I have time. I may go over by a couple of minutes, but there's a, there are a few more in the slides. So here's what we do. Let's say I start off at the current point, at the current estimate. I look at the derivative, the derivative is negative. 
So the derivative is negative means the function is increasing in the negative side, correct? So I have some initial step. Then I take the step and then I look at the derivative again. So in R prop, you're not going to take the value of the derivative, you're only looking at the sign. And you find that the derivative is still negative. This means that you are good, that the direction in which you are walking is a good direction because the function is still decreasing in that direction. So what is the obvious thing to do? You say, well, I'm doing the right thing. Let me do more of the same. So you're going to increase the step size by some factor alpha. And the next step is going to be some alpha times the previous step size. Then you check the derivative here again. It still says that you should go forward. So now you'll increment the current step size again by alpha. So the new step size is going to be alpha squared delta w and takes and you go all the way out here. When you go out here, what you will find is that now suddenly the derivative has changed sign. The derivative tells me I must be going back. So that tells me I've overshot my minimum. So not a good thing. So I'll go right back to the previous step and now I'll take a smaller step. Basically, the step I was originally intending to take, I will shrink it by a factor beta and take that step forward to get to this new position. So did, that, did the algorithm make sense to all of you guys? It was very quickly presented. Anyone? Questions? Yeah, we're just taking the, the difference between two points and seeing what the sign is. So, we are not even, so, so, we are, so you would be actually computing the derivative here using the back prop. Okay. Right? Then you only look at the sign. The sign tells you if you're going in the correct direction or not. That's it. Oh, okay. Right? So if the derivative, sign of the derivative at the current step is the same as the sign of the derivative in the previous step, yeah. I'm going the right way. So I'm going to take a longer step. Ah, okay. It doesn't care about the magnitude. It doesn't <laughs> care about the magnitude. On the other hand, if it's changed, then I have to go back and fix myself. I'll take a smaller step. So I have some pseudocode over here. Uh, you typically also have a ceiling and a floor on the step size. But the key point is just by looking at the signs of the derivatives, you can, uh, you can uh, decide whether your current step is good or not and whether you should, extract, you should uh, take a longer step or whether you should go back and then take a smaller step. And the only thing you're using backprop for is to compute these derivatives and you're only going to use their sign. Right. So it's a, it's a remarkably simple first order algorithm and it's generally much more efficient than gradient descent. And it's actually competitive against some of the more advanced second order methods that we currently use and makes almost no assumptions about the loss function. You're not even assuming that it's convex. So it's a really nice algorithm. And it's a bit of a shame that we don't see you know, it being used more. The only thing is that you're going to locally retain the step size for every single uh, parameter. So here's a little poll on R prop. Let me, for those of you who are not on the class, let me show you the prop. Diksha, we have a question. Does this mean that R prop cannot jump out of local minimum? So, uh, not necessarily, right? Because uh, if your initial step is large, for instance, it is going to bounce around and uh, it's going to adjust your step sizes over time. If you went across local minimum, it's going, eventually you're going to find a position where the, the, uh, uh, so the sign of the derivative changes. That's probably going to happen in a large bowl and then you'd go back and you'd find it and you'd find the minimum. So R prop naturally gravitates towards really big bowls and big bowls tend to be global minima or at least you know, good minima. So R prop is uh, uh, with an appropriate choice of initial step, it actually will find a pretty good solution. Did that answer you? Yeah, gotcha, thanks. Yeah, all right. So there are other such algorithms like quick prop, which was proposed by Scott Falman over here, which explicitly computes uh, uh, the second derivative through the method of uh, differences. 
I won't go over it, but please take a look, it's on the slides. So story so far, gradient descent can miss obvious answers and vanilla gradient descent may be too slow or unstable due to the differences between dimensions. Uh, second order methods which you haven't covered can normalize the variation across dimensions but are complex because they require you to compute second derivatives. Uh, you can have, we also saw that uh, decaying learning rates, uh, having too large a step size initially is not a bad thing. And uh, decaying learning rates can improve convergence. Methods that decouple the dimensions can improve convergence, but they have the problem of deciding what the optimal step size really is uh, because you can't really compute the second derivative. So let's go back and quickly look at this uh, problem again. Uh, guys, I'm going to go a few minutes over. Please bear with me. I'm, uh, I apologize in advance, right? So uh, now with dimension independent learning rates, the solution will convert smoothly in some directions, but oscillate or diverge in the other directions. That's our problem. So here is the new proposal. Instead of computing the second derivative and such like, let's just keep track of the oscillations. And let's emphasize the steps in directions that converge smoothly and shrink the steps in directions which where these steps bounce around. So for example, if you had a, uh, if you were trying to find an estimate and you start off from this point, you do gradient descent here, you go here. You do gradient descent here, you go here. You do gradient descent here, you go here. What you find is that in the vertical direction, they're bouncing around, right? If the vertical direction is bouncing around, but the, but the this is not even a very good picture. Uh, let me, it is this. So let's uh, take a look. We want to get here. And let's say I'm sort of sequentially going getting to the solution in the horizontal direction, but in the vertical direction and diverging. So my estimates are going to be something like this, right? Now, just looking at these estimates tells me something. If I just looked at these and say, hey, in the vertical direction, I'm bouncing around. So that probably means I'm, I'm sort of jumping around across the minimum. In the horizontal direction, I'm going you know, cleanly towards some point. So this tells me that what is happening in the vertical direction is not a good thing. What's happening in the horizontal direction is a good thing, right? I want to cancel these. I want to account for these. So what I can do is take a look at the history of all of the steps I took. And if I took an average of all of the gradients in the past until this point, say I'm currently what would the average of the derivatives in the vertical direction be? Anyone? Zero. It's gonna be close to zero, right? So just by looking at the average, whereas in the horizontal direction, it's going to be consistent. And so by instead of taking only the local derivative, if I took the average of all of the derivatives in the past, this hideous behavior is going to be converted to this clean behavior. So the magic now becomes how do I maintain the derivatives of all of the steps in the past? Now I could have taken 50,000 steps so far. You don't want to be maintaining 50 to 50,000 derivatives and averaging, but then there's a solution to this. You can use a running average. So at each point, you just maintain a running average and increment just the running average. So uh, this is our momentum method. Momentum method, the current step size is going to be some factor times the previous step. This is done, uh, this is done by component really, right? Uh, this is done by gradient, but this naturally will cancel out the components. So the current step is going to be some factor times the previous step minus the step suggested by the current gradient. So it's basically saying uh, here, I don't have to independently deal with the two, two, two components. If I simply uh, averaged the gradient at each point, the X component of the gradient is going to sort of average out into something nice and the Y component of the gradient is gonna cancel out. So all I have to do is 
say that I'm going to maintain a running average of all of the steps so far. And then at the current point, I just compute the gradient term and I uh, takes and I add it to this running average. And I, I use this running averaged step to update my parameter. So if you did this, this is what your vanilla gradient descent would do. If I use the running average, this is going to begin canceling out the oscillations in the vertical direction and you're going to get to the solution really quickly. So uh, there's, uh, and depending on how you compute the running average, you will get this, get to the solution faster or slower. Questions? Anyone? Uh, if you look at this mathematically, I mean, this is the original update step plus a beta delta W. Uh, so if that is an average, uh, then shouldn't it be already zero and not affect the original update anyway? So it's a running average. And if you've got a perfect, it, it won't exactly be zero. It's going to be small, hopefully, right? In one step. But then again, you keep accumulating stuff, right? So let's say it's zero at one point. Then at the next step, it's going to, you're going to add something negative, but the time after that, you're going to cancel it out. Okay. Right. So, and by, and by appropriately setting the betas and etas, you're going to get much lesser oscillatory behavior. But actually that's a very good question. So I recommend that you plot it out. And there's a solution even to that. And I'll just do this in a minute and then I'll stop the class. So I have the uh, pseudocode for this. This is the vanilla gradient descent. You come accumulated the derivatives over all of the training instances and then just did a gradient descent up, uh, update. Whereas for momentum, uh, you're going to keep track of the current step. And then after computing the average gradient, you do the running average of the step size, the previous value of the step minus some eta times the gradient. And the actual update is done by this delta w. So last topic of the day, uh, it's going to take a, two minutes. Now, here's what we did in the momentum method. At some point, let's say we had taken this step over here. If you take the step over here, then you compute the gradient. The gradient is going to be against the level set. So you're going to go in this, the gradient would be in this direction. So the gradient descent step is going to recommend this step, but then you're going to average that with a shrunk version of this guy. And that is going to be your final step right? That's your momentum method. What is happening over here is that you are taking the step, you're, you're computing the gradient and then adding the step to this point. But so, so you're, you're computing the gradient, you're taking the gradient step and then adding in the scaled version of the previous step. So this is what you're really doing. You can change the order of the two operations. So here, the first step was you took the gradient step. The second step was you added in the scaled version of the previous step, and that gave you the final step. So the next time around, you take a gradient step, and then you take a scaled version of this green step, and that's going to take you somewhere here. Let's change the order. Now, I will first take a scaled version of the previous step, and then take a gradient step. So it's the same operation as before but I just changed the order of the two, the, the two steps. And that will give my final update. That is called Nesterov's accelerated gradient and it's uh, uh, provably more optimal than simple momentum methods. So uh, here's how to compare the two. Here's what Nesterov's method would do. Here's what momentum would do. So if you were coming this way, this way your previous step, in momentum, you'd first take a step along the gradient and then add in a uh, shrunk version of this guy and end up over here. So then if you were continuing this, you take a step along this and then take a shrunk version of this guy and you'd end up out here. And you'd, this would take several steps to get to the minimum. Whereas if you reverse the order, you'd first take a step here and then take, and then add the gradient. So this is going to be your uh, new update, then you're going to extend this step here and then walk along the gradient. In this particular example, you get to the solution in just two steps. So you can see why 
uh, Nestroff's method is actually going to be much more efficient than uh, than uh, simple momentum methods. Again, I have pseudocode for this over here. I won't go over it. We'll return to momentum and trend-based methods. Uh, and we have our final poll, and I'm done for the day. Uh, Piksha, we have two questions about the beta values. So I know you know that they are shown 0 0.9. Why? Do, how do you choose that beta value? And does this also have to decay over time? So uh, these are uh, these are actually very good questions, right? This is again. This ends up being a heuristic, right? Try solve answer this momentum poll, and this should give you part of the answer. Okay. Uh, anyway, so we're done with the poll. Post this question on Piazza simply because we're kind of out of time. Again, I apologize for running over. This is, it's really hard to get myself synchronized on, on Zoom. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I forgot to post today's slides. I'll be posting today's slides in the next few minutes. And I'll take any questions you have on Piazza. Uh, Rashmi, can you stop recording? Yeah.